is Property Question Time with me, Emily Evans. This is the show where you get to ask our panel of experts your property questions. And with me today are Paul Higgs, CEO of the Millbank Group, James Jenkins, financial advisor of Money Sprite, and Simon Zucci, the founder of the Property Investors Network. So first question for you, James. I am getting a lump sum of money through losing my job and would like to pay my mortgage off, lump sum and some savings, which will equal about the same amount left on my mortgage with a little left over to help me until I get another job. I will owe around 63,000 on my mortgage. I have an early redemption fee of 2% until April 2018 and 1% until April 2019. My plan was to overpay the max. 10%, about six and six and a half thousand in December. And then again in January, about five and a half thousand. My mortgage year is January to December. My mortgage is 395 pounds a month, fixed until April 2019 and 1.74%. I'd rather pay off my mortgage and have that feeling of no mortgage if possible, but only if it's the best thing to do financially. Wow, that's a long one. I'll let you answer that. Right, okay. <laughs> um, I guess the answer would be what, what they're planning to do, it sounds like, um, is sounds pretty good in terms of use the money, pay, use the 10% overpayment facility for this calendar year. And as the year end for the mortgage is December, then in January that will 10% will restart again, 10% of what's left at the time, which is why they've got a reducing figure that they can pay off without charges. Now, without doing all the calculations, because I need to sit and work them all through, I would say very loosely, if you're going to pay them from April 2018, if you would pay a 1% penalty from then until 19, you've got a year's worth of interest at 1.74%. If your penalty to come out of that mortgage is only 1%, then in theory, if you make that payment early, you're going to pay, that's going to cost you around about £500 by that point for that 1% charge, versus around about 900, just under £900 worth of interest if you kept the mortgage for the rest of that year until your penalty has expired. So very generically and loosely, it would probably make sense to use the overpayment facility now, use it again in January, then just sit tight on the mortgage till April till that penalty drops to 1% and then pay off the balance. That would probably just about work out to be slightly better overall. Um, the key thing I would be making sure though for, for, for this person is that it's very well and good to have the feeling of no mortgage, but obviously if you've got savings tied you over until you find a job, you need to make sure that you've got enough to tide you over until you find that job. So the good thing about maybe doing the 10%, the 10% and then waiting till April is to give you a bit of time before tying all your money up and paying it off the property because you might need that to live on if the work that you want doesn't, doesn't come along at the right time. So I would say it makes sense financially as long as the whole situation doesn't leave them completely bereft of anything left in the account afterwards. And ultimately that's quite a low interest rate anyway, isn't it? It's a good interest rate they're paying, um, but I guess the reality is you know, 1% penalty versus 1.74 interest for 12 months Financially, it, it's not big figures you're talking about. It's a very low mortgage. It's around about 50,000 will be left by April anyway. So it's, it's a good interest rate. Um, the difference will be when you have the overpayment, most mortgage lenders will give you an option to either um, use the overpayment to reduce your monthly payment or use the overpayment to reduce the mortgage term so you keep paying the same. And the default for lenders is that they'll reduce the term so you keep paying the same monthly payment. So I would make sure that if she wasn't going to pay that off mortgage off all in one go, that if it's because of a reduced income, she'll probably want to reduce the monthly payment rather than reduce the term. So make sure she, that, I'm assuming she, make sure she makes it um, clear to the mortgage lender when she makes the other payments what impact she wants that to have on her mortgage, whether it be reducing the term or reducing the monthly payment. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. It's an interesting point. I mean, I think you're right, James, uh, about the, the overall principle about paying it off you described. But you made a really interesting point about <clears throat> is it always best to pay that mortgage off? Mm. Because if you think about it, that borrowing at such a low interest rate, mm they could potentially take that money, put it somewhere to earn more money and more than cover the interest and have some extra cash flow coming. So I think it's, yeah, there's a natural um, inclination to pay debt off. People think debt is bad, but when it's such a low cost, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. You know, I would just question, is that really the best thing to get some good advice on that, obviously. Yeah, um, but I would always think about it rather than just automatically wanting to clear down yeah. the debt. I think the important thing on that is it's always a balance between the low interest rate you're paying and what you're going to get 
to withhold Absolutely, that money yeah. and save it. I mean, you wouldn't just put it in the bank. No, nope. with other the things bank, you you're going to you're going to lose money. But, exactly. but if you want to put that money somewhere safe, leave it in there to to, to gain some money. I guess then yes. you potentially may get a better rate return than you do on the mortgage and leave it there for twelve months. Yeah. But I think what Simon's saying most importantly is you've got a lump sum. The best thing to do is to take financial advice and look at all your options. All the options, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so next question, Paul. Um, we are considering buying a group of properties which are together in one piece of land in a rural area. This consists of two three-bedroom houses and one bed uh, and a one-bed barn conversion, also a small annex. There is an issue, which is that the group of properties are in an area prone to flooding, like many others, and have had flood protection systems put in place. We cannot ascertain whether insurers would cover flood risk at this stage. Might this make the properties unmortgageable? So, uh, potentially, yes. So, uh, obviously, the key thing to do really now is, is, is to go out for quotes um, and get, you'll get con you know, conditional quotes um, subject to you purchasing so that you'll, you know, they'll know before they start um, whether they're going to be able to get insurance in place or not. Mo most insurers, they'll, um, even if they say that they'll, they'll insure you, it, it, it could very well be subject to all sorts of conditions. Um, so, I'm not sure if I should say this on national TV, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, in my experience, why it tends to work with insurers, uh, they'll only insure you if they think there's not going to be a claim. Um, so, uh, you, you know, get, get it sorted out up, up front and make sure um, you're happy with any conditions. There will almost certainly be conditions on it. You just need to make sure you're, you're happy with them and it doesn't um, allow the insurers the opportunity to fully wangle themselves out of it. Would you say it's got a lot worse in the last few years after we've had some really big floods in the UK? Um, has it become a lot harder to get mortgages on? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I don't know about mortgages, but, it, but in terms of insurance, yeah. so, so obviously, yeah, I, cl cl clearly, <clears throat> from a mortgagee's point of view, um, you know, they're not going to want to lend money on, on, on stuff that could potentially be looking at, you know, tens, hundreds, even thousands of pounds of cost. Um, and there's no insurance to cover it because then, you know, they're potentially left with the liability themselves, you know, or the bad debt. So yes, yeah, def definitely got much harder. Is that, um, was, was that buying properties that are already existing by the looks of it? Was it yeah, I there? think so, yeah. yeah. So yes. a, good, a good starting point might be for them to talk to the people who are selling the properties, find out who they're insured with, because then that'll give you an indication as to whether they are insurable mm -hmm. and who, who will take them on. If not, if it's a commercial type purchase, speak to a commercial insurance broker who will be able to search the market for you rather than you having to phone a million and one different insurers and run the same questions. Yeah. So first port call I would do is, is talk to the sellers or the agents selling it and find out who's insuring currently. Wonderful, great advice, thank you very much. Fantastic. Right, moving on, so Simon, <clears throat> we have exchanged contracts already and are due to complete next month. Bovis offered to pay our stamp duty as an incentive, which is just under 5,000 pounds. I was wondering, as now the stamp duty is abolished for us, as we are first time buyers, should Bovis offer us something else? Do you think we'd be able to get our solicitor's fee paid instead, or something similar? That's interesting. Obviously, once you exchange contracts, you are committed to the purchase, and obviously the terms are agreed. And I guess if the builder was willing to pay the stamp duty, which is no longer required, uh, it, it's no, no different for the buyer, I suppose. They're not paying any extra money or any less money. It's a benefit for the builder. So if I were them, I would see if they could negotiate. But if it's a national builder, it's unlikely they would get anything further. They could, they could argue maybe that, you know, is the builder saving this money? Maybe they could pay for legal fees or, you know, often in these new builds, they don't include carpets. So maybe they could put carpets in or some sort of fixtures and fittings that aren't normally there, um, which wouldn't cost the builder that much, but has a high perceived value to the buyer. So maybe that might be a way to go. Fantastic. Yeah, even maybe incentives like whether they get a washing machine included or exactly, just something, yeah. just something they buy to help. In bulk. These things don't cost them that much money and it might be a nice gesture from the builder. And it's really interesting because a lot of people will be in this situation. You know, when you buy a new building, you often exchange before it's completed. And um, this will be a problem for many people. So I'd suggest go and negotiate, see what you can do. Fantastic. Also, I would double check as well because when it comes to mortgaging um, and if maybe they're losing the help to buy loans or anything like that, incentives with the developer are all kind of agreed up front and they're all on the That's documentation. Right. Yeah. So any changes to that, generally it's going to mean going back to the mortgage lender, back to the help to buy and getting those documents re redone. So again, mm. timing could be, mm. could be key, but make sure you've checked all areas yes. when you're negotiating before you commit to whatever you, you, you do manage to renegotiate. Mm. It's a shame, isn't it, in a situation where the, in this case, 
the, the, the benefit of the stamp duty is actually going to the, them, the, yeah. the builder rather than the, the home build company rather than the first time buyer. I'll, I'll just add to that. I, um, I used to work in quite senior positions with PLC house builders for quite a number of years, so I'm pretty clued up in exactly how they work. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, that incentive of the stamp duty would have been a cost that they were taking on board um, it w yeah, they were effectively prepared to give away. So uh, now that they are not giving it away, there, there should still be an equivalent amount in the kitty. So I would absolutely go back and um, see what you can get off. Fantastic. It can't hurt, can it? Mm -hmm. It no. can't hurt. Worst I'll say is no, and you're still no worse off. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Right, and I think, James, you have a golden nugget for us today. Yeah, it links on a little bit actually to that question around stamp duty. Um, Obviously, there's been changes in stamp duty lately with for first-time buyers, but it sort of got me thinking about what the definition of a first-time buyer is in, in the UK. Um, and actually, there's a bit of confusion around what a first-time buyer actually is and looks like. So there's actually two kind of ways you can look at it. There's first-time buyer for mortgage lending purposes, and then there's first-time buyer for things like stamp duty or, or well, stamp duty um, purposes. So just really to be clear, when it comes to the legal side, that's probably a little bit easier and, and clearer to understand. A first-time buyer has to be a first-time buyer of property anywhere in the world to be able to qualify as a first-time buyer for stamp duty relief. So you can't own or have owned a property anywhere else in the world. If you do, and you've got to declare those things, if you do, you're not a first-time buyer, you're going to pay the normal stamp duty, and if you still own that property abroad, you're going to pay the normal stamp duty plus the 3% uplift um, for owning a second property. So first-time buyer, legally, no properties anywhere in the world. From a mortgage point of view, it's not quite as clear-cut because actually the lenders themselves pretty much dictate what they term a, a first-time buyer to be. And, and they can vary from all lenders. Most of them really sort of term them as around about three years since you last owned a property. So it's not that you've never kind of owned a property previously. And you can own a property in Spain. As long as this is your first property in the UK, they'll class you as a first-time buyer, generally speaking. So it is important that when you talk to a mortgage advisor or day one, when you start looking for properties, so that you get a full idea on costings, to explain the full thing about how much of a first-time buyer are you, what exactly your property ownership history is, where it is in the world, and then you'll get the right answers so you can budget up front for whether you're paying stamp duty, not paying stamp duty, paying extra stamp duty, or if you're going to get your free surveys and cashbacks that the lenders are going to be offering you potentially for first-time buyers. Thank you for that, that was very insightful. That's all we have time for for now, but stay with us as we'll be straight back after this break. And welcome back to Property Question Time with me, Emily Evans. I am here with our panel of experts, Paul Higgs, James Jenkins and Simon Zucci. First of all, we are going to start with a golden nugget. Simon, I hear you have a golden nugget for us. I do, yes. So often people think about getting into property investment and with all the changes we have from the government taxation to legislation, people sometimes think, well, is it really still worth investing? Um, and my belief is if you do your research and always do your due diligence and you know what you're doing, yeah, absolutely investing in property is still very, very profitable. If you look at the Times 1000 rich list, about 66% of those people have either made their money in property or put it into property. So there's a real common theme there. But you don't have to be wealthy to invest in property. There are ways of working with other people's money, being creative. And so it's all about getting education and learning how to do it. And, you know, if you read the tabloid, you know, we'd all pack up shop and go home tomorrow. Um, but, you know, find other people who have been successful investors and find out what they've done and ask them questions. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to learn on your own. There's so many resources out there. There's the internet, there are books, there are CDs. You could really gain a huge amount of knowledge and become very successful in property if that's what you want to do. And there's still a great opportunity to do it. Thank you for that, Simon. Now, first question to you, James. How much will switching bank account affect my mortgage application? I'm considering switching current account to TSB to get some free cash to put towards saving for a house. I'm looking to be taking out a mortgage somewhere between the next four to 12 months. I know that switching bank accounts puts a mark on your credit rating. I am also aware that a credit score is affected by how long you stay with a bank. Will this have a negative effect if I switch, even though I still have other accounts with my current bank? Okay, um, there's a few areas to, to cover in that question. You keep giving me all the long questions today, don't you? I do. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, if you switch bank account, when you switch, they will do a credit check to do that. 
um, we put on there, it'll leave a mark on your credit file. What it, 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 it does, it leaves a record of a search, effectively. Now, what that can do is the number of searches in a short period of time can knock down your, your sort of general credit score. Um, but if they're looking at sort of four to 12 months' time, realistically, after the first sort of three to six months, the impact of that credit search on your credit file is going to be negative anyway. Not sorry, not negative, it's going to be negated. Um, so it won't really impact you if you're sort of four to six months. It's a really good idea that if you want to switch bank accounts to do it now, because then the earlier you do it, fantastic. Um, but also maybe look at, uh, talk to a multi advisor, because you might find that some lenders are offering current account exclusive products that are better products if you bank with that lender. So it might be worth just having a look at a couple of different banks and building societies that you may consider taking the mortgage from and see if they've got sort of good account holder exclusives that actually you might benefit more from than, than sort of the £100 or whatever it is cash back you'll get from that bank just to switch bank accounts. So there is a, a good um, scheme. Most lenders, if they're going to give you a current account exclusive, will generally want you to have had your account with them for three to six months. So it could be perfect sort of timing to take advantage of those kind of deals. As far as how long you've held your bank account for, every lender has a different credit score and not all lenders ask the question how long you've had your account for. So it doesn't really matter on that side of things. I wouldn't be too concerned about how long you've had that physical bank account for. It's more about just making sure that generally speaking y your credit's in good order, that you've paid all your payments and everything else because one credit check to open a bank account is not going to stop you getting a mortgage. Um, but more about check the bank you're thinking of going with to see if there's any better deals for mortgage you can get from banking with you know, a Nationwide or a Santander or somebody like that. People get really scared about credit searches, don't they, with regards to if they're renting something, like a, a tenant referencing like credit check, yeah. um, getting a new bank. They're not really that bad, are they? They only leave a very small footprint, am I correct? Well, some, lender, some mortgage lenders, for example, will leave what they call soft footprints. So actually, that's a footprint that only you can see. Um, and anybody else looking at your credit file, other lenders, can't see that search. So it has no impact on your credit score whatsoever. Um, but people are, are, they are absolutely very scared of credit, credit scores and credit searches and, and there's a big kind of mystery about what it is, you know, this big sort of record about you in the dark that everyone's going to judge you on. Um, and it, it, it's really not as bad as what, what people think. Um, you know, yeah, if you have lots and lots of credit checks done in a short space of time that are hard footprint searches, it's going to impact your ability to get credit going forward because there's a reason people are saying no. And you're only doing the checks because people are saying no. But really, one, one to change your bank account and one to look at you know, a mortgage option, it's, it's not going to hurt you. Great. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Right, so next question. On to you, Paul. Hope this is a bit of a shorter one than uh, James's have been. I would like to open a Help to Buy ISA. However, I have used the Moneybox Investment ISA service in which your money is invested into various things, including companies like British Land and a Global Property Shares Fund. Would this count as me investing in land, which is against the life ISA rules? With Moneybox, it's a stocks and shares ISA, so it can't be an investment in land. Am I right in thinking this? They are right in thinking that it can't be invested in land. Um, but before I go on, I should add that I'm, I'm not an ISA or a tax expert, OK? Um, however, um, investing in a fund or a property company in terms of stocks and shares um, isn't investing in land directly. So I'm pretty sure that'd be fine on that count. Yeah, because it's once removed, isn't it? So rather than direct, it's not Yeah, I, th I think it's about direct investment in land, which obviously is not what they're talking about. So Wonderful. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Right, final question. Simon, currently considering renting a flat from a private landlord and the landlord has made it clear that he won't be securing the deposit. We have this in writing. What incentive is there for him to do this? Is this unusual? Uh, well, I'd be rather concerned if the landlord wasn't securing a registering deposit. You know, as a landlord, you have to do it. Now, you don't have to take a deposit, but if you do take one, it has to be registered through a proper process and should be protected. And so I'd be concerned if the landlord's taking that kind of cavalier approach, that's not a good sign. What else will they not do? Will they do the maintenance on the flat if there are problems? Will they you know, respond to your inquiries? And so personally, I'd recommend go and find a different flat. Um, uh, there are one or two bad landlords out there who give other landlords a bad name, unfortunately. Um, so there's plenty of property to choose from. Go and find a good landlord who's doing everything they should do and wants to provide good, affordable accommodation to someone work with them. And if someone's a bit of a rogue landlord, just don't work with them. 
And these schemes to, that you like, where you register your deposit with, some of them are free, so you don't yeah, have to pay to get it done. There's a couple of different ones. There's one where the money is held by a government agency. There's one where actually there's insurance where the landlord can still hold the money, but there's insurance. So I'm not sure why they don't want to do it. Um, maybe they, they're an inexperienced landlord and don't really understand, but ignorance is no excuse for not knowing how to do it. So what they could do is they could go back to the landlord and say, well, actually, we believe you really should be registering and protecting that deposit. If you do that, we'd love to come to the flat, but if you don't do that, you know what, I think we're going to go elsewhere. So thank you for that, Simon. That was very insightful. Um, and to finish off, I think we have a golden nugget from you, Paul. One of the questions earlier was um, about someone that's uh, buying property in a rural area, I think, that included the barn conversion. So um, I'm uh, my specialism is, is planning and development. So here's hopefully a, a useful little tip um, in that area. So now, um, well, for, for just over a year, um, if you want to convert barns and agricultural buildings in rural areas, and that in, includes the green belt, um, you can do so without the need for full planning permission. So basically there are permitted development rights that allow people to convert agricultural buildings um, up to a maximum of 450 square metres and a maximum of three units um, with, with via a, a short tracked planning um, route really, so um, permitted development even in the green belt. So um, that means lots of potentially, um, you know, not very valuable and unviable um, buildings in agriculture areas could be um, could be very valuable development opportunities. Sadly, that's all we have time for today. But please do keep your property questions coming. Please go onto our website at www.property-tv.co.uk or email them to info at property-tv.co.uk. From me and our panel of experts, Paul Higgs, James Jenkins and Simon Zucci, thank you very much. I've been Emily Evans. I'll see you soon.